I'd like to welcome everybody to the Unitarian Church of Los Alamos. Whoever you are, wherever you are in your life's journey, whomever you love, whatever you believe, you are welcome here. My name is James Carroll. This is our adult religious education class. Uh, this is part six of our Buddhism series, Mahayana Buddhism. I want to remind everybody that we do have a, a web page uh, called, it's at sites.google.com, View Comparative Religion. And it has uh, links to all the videos, links to all the kind of recommended readings I've put up. Uh, so I, do, I record the classes if you miss one, or if you want to go back, or if you're looking for, to remember a specific book, you don't have to write it down. You can go to the webpage and it'll have lists of all the books that I recommend and additional reading and that sort of thing. It also has a calendar, which I try to keep up to date. I don't actually have the dates for February yet, but as soon as I do, I'll put them on there. And so you can go there and figure out when the next classes are because they float. Um, they depend on my work schedule, and so they come. They aren't always in the same day every year, every month. So uh, we've done a lot of stuff on Buddhism. So if you want to quickly review, we've had five classes. We did the life of the Buddha. We talked. I did a sermon on the marks of existence, and then I did the, the teachings of the Buddha, which expanded on that and, and gave it some of the more detail. Uh, we did mindfulness and meditation. Talked about how to meditate. And then last class was in November, where we talked about Buddhism after the life of the Buddha. So it's been a couple months. And we've had some other classes in between on things like the secularization hypothesis and, and sociology of religion and that sort of thing. And now we're coming back to Buddhism. Uh, so uh, last class, because it's been a month, uh, to review quickly. When the Buddha died, he created something of a, uh, a crisis in the community, specifically around what to do next regarding his, his teachings and, and worship. Uh, you know, what do you worship? How do you worship? It's hard to worship the Buddha as a deity, if that's what you're going to do, uh, if you believe in nirvana, right? That he en exited samsara and is no longer here to, to worship or to intervene, etc. So what do they do? And that was the, the center, the, these are the center, central um, issues after his death. Who, who settles disputes? Who has authority with him gone? What is the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha? Which teachings are authentic and which ones are not? Which ones do we consider canon? Um, what are the monastic rules? If you're going to join the monastic community, what are the rules you're expected to keep? And can those rules be changed? If so, how? And, uh, and if we're going to worship uh, the Buddha, what rituals do we have? How do we worship? What do we worship? And what is the idea behind that? So the idea was um, that after he died, there were several relics of his, of his cremation that were kept. Those were taken to several, um, several stupas. We'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, there was a monastic tradition that carried on his teachings uh, with specific rules uh, that divided the, the, the followers into lay followers and monastic followers, and it was the job of the lay followers. They would gather karma to be born into a better situation where they could then, at one, some point, pursue nirvana themselves. So the idea is, if you're a lay disciple, you do good works, achieve car good karma, and support the monks who then achieve nirvana. And so in the next life, you would become a monk and achieve nirvana. Etc. So the idea is you, you acquire karma on the one side, or as a monastic follower, you uh, seek nirvana. Um, these relics, oh, then they had a Buddhist council that determined the canon, uh, they, and that's, that's the, um, the, the monastic tradition. They got together, decided what they considered as canon, and they wrote them down. It's a massive tome, sets of tripartite. There's three different sets. Some of them determine the, uh, the monastic rules. Some of them determine the, the teachings and the philosophy. And it's just this massive, it's much bigger than the biblical canon. And then they established a set of worship including relics. This is the uh, traditional uh, begging bowl of the Buddha. And this is um, a worship ritual where this individual is giving uh, homage to the Buddha put it by putting a, some gold, extra gold leaf on a statue of the Buddha. And, and this, this sort of worship puja is thought to um, produce good karma. It's also thought that you can pray to these uh, statues and, and, achieve, uh, and receive blessings, uh, help in your life, etc. How does that work? Well, 
the idea was that the Buddha had, you know, if you pray to, pray to a god, the god is up there in heaven looking down on you and can bless you. If the Buddha's gone, he's not up in heaven. He's in nirvana. He's gone, uh, right? The, the, his self is dissolved, so to speak. So how do you pray and get blessings from the Buddha? Well, the idea is that he left behind a set of merit, karma, unused karma that he kind of left behind. And by praying to the statue, etc., you can access this karma and you can achieve good works. Uh, uh, that, that work, the, the, the value of those good works can apply to you and you can be blessed with health or whatever. Uh, it also, the act of, of uh, worshiping the statues, brings to your mind as a sort of meditative technique the teachings, which then blesses your life in, in a purely kind of non-superstitious way, right? The, the, by thinking about the teachings, by, by performing the worship, you think about the teachings. By thinking about the teachings, you uh, become yourself changed and your life is improved. So lots of ways that the worship ritual was thought to benefit the people. Uh, they built these temples around the relics. And we talked about the worship through mandalas, a meditation technique where they would, they would paint or, or meditate upon or, or build through sand these different um, shapes with the circle and the square representing the earth and the heavens, a cosmogram of the heavens, and, and a, a scale model of the temple itself. In the temple was placed the relics, which were thought to carry this, this good karma that you could access to uh, achieve you know, blessings in this life, etc. So uh, that is essentially Theravada Buddhism. Now, Theravada Buddhism is a modern approach. It, certainly it has, so back up. There are at least three schools of Buddhism, Theravada, Mahayana, and Vajrayana. And this is you know, a map of their, of their distributions. So um, you can think of Theravada as what we've just described, that monastic tradition uh, with the lay people and the temples, etc. That's, that's basically Theravada Buddhism. Uh, Theravada Buddhism is intentionally a conservative movement. So Theravada, movement, uh, Theravada Buddhism is modern, uh, but it is an intentionally conservative. It tries its best to, to adhere to that earliest kind of concept of the Buddhist teachings, the Pali canon of scripture, the earlier canon, etc. Mahayana is a reform movement, and Theravada, and sorry, and Vajrayana can be thought of as a subset of Mahayana. So we're going to talk about Mahayana, and then we'll decide whether we're going to do more about, uh, about uh, Vajrayana and stuff later. But for now, Mahayana is a, 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 a reform movement of the earlier tradition. And you can think of Theravada as, that, as a, a holdover of that earlier tradition. So as a, as a reform movement, you can ask several questions like, when? Well, we think it, it, it began somewhere around 100 BCE to 100 CE, we think. Uh, but by 300 and 400 CE, we start to get uh, very clear records of, of what we would consider Mahayana teachings. Uh, and so by then it's, it's become more popular and you, it starts to show up more in the records. Uh, it did begin in India. So Buddhism itself began in India, Mahayana began in India as well and then moved outward. Uh, so it didn't begin you know, in, in outside of India, even though Buddhism had spread outside of India by this point. It didn't begin there, it began in India and moved outward. And there are lots of branches, some of these you've heard of, right? Um, Chen Buddhism, Korean Sion, Japanese Zen. Most, uh, so you, I know most of you have at least heard of Zen. Um, Nichiren Buddhism, Vietnamese Buddhism. And if you include uh, Vajrayana, you get uh, all these other sects as well. And you can, because you can think of Vajrayana as, a, as another subset of Mahayana. Uh, so, where did it come from? Well, let's back up and talk about Hinduism for a minute, because if it began in India, it was influenced by Hinduism. And Buddhism itself originated as a Hindu sect. So there are many layers of Hinduism. If we go all the way back to think about what we did a couple years ago when we talked about Hinduism, we talked about Indus Valley civilization, Aryan Vedic religion, and then philosophical Hinduism, devotional Hinduism, and modern Hinduism. So. Uh, this is why Hinduism has this philosophy of many, many paths up the same mountain, because there are multiple kind of layers of Hindu traditions. Philosophical Hinduism involved renunciation. You would go off, become essentially a monk, and you would try to renounce your attachment to the world so that you would not be reborn in samsara. 
That is what Theravada and the earlier Buddhist traditions evolved from. So you can think of, this is, this is grossly oversimplifies it, and as such, it's basically a lie, but it's still a good way to think about it uh, because it gives you the general idea. Theravada Buddhism is like Jnana Yoga, or sorry, uh, yeah, Jnana Yoga, philosophical Hinduism. It's the idea that you have to renounce and, and become a monk and lose your attachment to the things of this world and to, to karmic action so that you can escape samsara. Mahayana Buddhism is a lot like bhakti yoga or devotional Hinduism. Uh, as such, uh, it tries to find a way to um, allow somebody who is not renouncing all things and giving up everything, who is still living at home, who's living a householder life, who might be married, who might have kids, who might have um, responsibilities, and to find a way to achieve nirvana within their responsibilities of life. And as such, it has a bigger role for the, the householder, for the lay member. Uh, now, it's still a, a monastic tradition, but it has a larger role for the lay member because you can think of it as Buddhism's version of bhakti yoga, or the way of devotion. It's Buddhist devotional practice. So here's the sort of things that, uh, that traditionally set apart Mahayana Buddhism from the Buddhism that came before and then Theravada Buddhism today. Um, they talk about the second turning of the wheel of the Dharma. Traditionally, there are three turnings of the wheel. We'll talk about each of these in detail. So uh, the turnings of the wheel, though, are the, the, the times when scriptures were canonized and written down. So they have new scripture. Uh, one of those is the Lotus Sutra. It's the most influential, and we'll talk about it. Um, they will talk about the great vehicle. In fact, that is what Mahayana means, the great vehicle or the great cart. They have a lot of discussion of skillful means, which is one of my favorite aspects of Buddhism. I love the concept of skillful means. They talk a lot about compassion. Now, this doesn't mean that regular Buddhism doesn't talk about compassion, but for Mahayana Buddhism, compassion was an entryway into the Buddha, Buddhist path, into the path of enlightenment, in a way that we don't see really in the Pali Canon, the earlier canon. Um, they talk about the bodhisattva ideal. A bodhisattva is somebody who is in opposition to an arhant. An arhant is somebody who has achieved enlightenment and will not be reborn. A bodhisattva is somebody who has tasted enlightenment but chooses to come back and be reborn over and over and over again in samsara. You see the connection between that and what we just said about the householder. There is salvation inside of samsara but his idea is that he's coming back over, or, or she, is coming back over and over again in order to help other people achieve enlightenment. They've achieved a measure of enlightenment, but they're, they're hanging back from full Buddhahood so that they can return to samsara and help other people achieve enlightenment. Uh, it's almost like I'm going to hang out here until everyone is ready and then we'll all kind of step over together. You can think about it that way. Um, and so again, you can see how that integrates this concept of compassion. All these ideas hang together. They're, they're all interconnected. Uh, we also have this idea of a cosmic heavens, which uh, is something that, that uh, Siddhartha Buddha really refused to talk about. You know, he kind of said that the nature of the skies and the heavens and, and all this stuff is irrelevant. Let's just figure out the end of suffering. Uh, Mahayana Buddhism sees this grand vision of the cosmos, and that's an important part of Mahayana Buddhism, so you can see how that's kind of an evolution of what came before, and, and it's different from what came before. And uh, they have a whole pantheon of celestial Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Bodhisattvas who live in the heavens, but who you can pray to and they will answer your prayer. You see, this is a different answer than the one we gave before, which is the Buddha's karma is left behind in these relics and you can access it by praying to the, to the Buddha, uh, but the Buddha is gone. Well, in, in Mahayana Buddhism, there are people who are not gone, people who are on the bodhisattva path who have achieved a measure of enlightenment, and you can pray to them, and they can help you. Again, you can access their compassion. So compassion is something for the bodhisattvas, for us to access the compassion of the bodhisattvas, and also to actuate our path towards becoming enlightened through our compassion for others. You see, compassion works on all three levels. Uh, and then, of course, this idea of salvation and enlightenment is now available to the lay disciples through this new way. And they'll talk a lot about emptiness 
emptiness was always part of the Buddhist teachings, we believe, but um, for them, emptiness has this extra emphasis and slightly new meaning. Uh, and we'll talk about each of these in, in some major detail. So, So, let's talk about the second turning of the wheel of the Dharma. The first turning is what we discussed in that first Buddhist council. Right? They wrote down all these texts. The second turning happens around 100 BC to, to 200 AD. We're not sure exactly when. But somewhere in there, some people started showing up with extra uh, sutras. And they said, these are teachings of the Buddha. But there was some awareness in the sutras themselves that these were new. These are not things that people had access to earlier. They were not part of the canonized text from the first, first, uh, first conference. And, and you'll notice the same problem crops up in Christianity, right, and, and in Islam. They, all these religious traditions have this same problem. What are the authentic teachings of the leader of the church, or the, the founder of the religion, excuse me? Which teachings are, are authentic? Uh, and, and when new ones show up, you know, this is how Gnostic Christianity starts. This is how, um, you know, you get these. In fact, the, the, the canon was created in Christian tradition because there were people showing up with extra texts and saying, these are true teachings of Christ. And they're like, well, we got to figure out which ones are forgeries. And so this whole idea of new texts coming forth is not, a, is not a, something unique to Buddhism. But in this case, uh, the texts claim, and they almost always do, that they were original teachings of the, the founder. Now, that's questionable and, and, and possibly doubtful. Uh, in fact, uh, my favorite example to compare this to is um, Josiah. In the biblical text, there's this story of a king, Josiah, who uh, opens up the temple that had been closed for so long and no one had worshipped there, and they went in and they cleaned it out, and they claimed to find a, a new book of the law that they didn't know about. And they're like, oh, look, New book of the law, and we aren't following these laws. And there was this whole reform based around keeping this new book of laws that they found in the temple. A.K. somebody wrote and stuck in the temple and, and claimed was an original book of Moses' teachings, right? This, this is what happens. People invent these teachings and they claim they are old. That being said, these teachings were written, uh, I, I think, the insights, I think what's happening is that the philosophers of the tradition are coming up with valuable insights through their own religious experiences in meditation, etc. And then somebody else wants to justify those teachings and writes a text about how the Buddha originally taught this. And of course, then the teaching has to say, well, yes, but it was secret. Right? So it was kept secret for hundreds of years, but now everyone's ready to hear it. And so suddenly the text is, is showing up and, and it's used to justify these philosophical insights from these teachers. So, uh, you know, my, my perspective on this is that historically it's probably not, there probably aren't authentic texts from the Buddha, but they do represent authentic teachings from philosophers and, and practitioners of Buddhism who created genuine insights. And some of them are, are useful and, and even true, and you can test them out through your own life, and you, you, in meditation you can find these same, you know what I mean? So that they're not useless just because they're not authentic teachings of the Buddha, but, but the, the history of the Mahayana is very difficult to understand. People have done a lot of work to try to figure out the origin of these texts. Who wrote them? When did they write them? And it's very mysterious. It's very hard to do. Uh, there was a thought for a while that it was a lay person's movement because it gives greater freedom to the lay people. But the earliest stuff we're finding all has monastic ties. Okay, so it's a monastic tradition that's reforming to give the lay people more uh, access to salvation or, or to, to move in a more devotional direction. Okay, well, which uh, monasteries? Well, we got pieces of Mahayana texts and showing up here. One piece will show up here. One other piece will show up here. Another piece over here. And so it appears that what we had is multiple insights appearing at different times and then all kind of co coalescing. And then another group kind of rejecting it and saying, no, we, we don't believe all this kind of new innovations. We're going to go back to the older group. And it's only at that point that, that Mahayana Buddhism becomes a separate school, a separate concept. But originally, it, was, it, it didn't evolve as a specific break. It evolved within the original school. And that's our best guess. But we don't really know where it came from. But the second set of texts is called the second turning of the wheel. And so if you look for second wheel texts, those are the Mahayana Buddhist texts. 
The most famous of those is the Lotus Sutra, and it is probably the most important. And it's long, and there's a lot of stuff in it, uh, but we're going to tell. It has one parable that is relevant, specifically relevant, for what Mahayana is, what it means, and for, uh, for how it thought of itself. And that is the, the parable of the burning house. <clears throat> there is um, a sutra where the Buddha was to said to have taught that everything is on fire. And what he meant was all of our, all of our dharmas, all, where in this sense dharma means our, um, our perceptions. Our, uh, Western philosophers might call it qualia, right? The, the sensations. All of our sensations, are, they're really on fire. They're, they're not um, peaceful, you know, they're, they're burning. Well, this text uh, claims that the Buddha started teaching the bodhisattva ideal to, to a select group of people who were ready for it, right? It was the secret teaching of the Buddha. And, and these, uh, these people said, well, what about all the things you taught before? Were those things just wrong? And in response, he told the parable of the burning building. And the parable goes like this. Uh, a father has children whom he loves. The children are in the building at home, and they're playing with their toys in the building, and the building catches fire, and all is burning. See, that's a reference to that earlier teaching, all, all is on fire. But the father is outside. He makes his way outside because he, he can, and this is the Buddha who's made his way out. And he looks up, and he sees the people still in the house, and he says, come out, all is burning. And the people say, the kids say, I don't want to. I'm having fun with my toys. I'm going to stay in the building and play. And the father knows that's a horrible idea. Uh, but, but the people don't want to leave. Now, that's, that's common, right? This is, this is the idea that, that people don't want to give up the things that are hurting them. So how do we lure them out? So the father tells them that he has all these wonderful... They're in there, but they don't want to leave because they've got toys to play with. So he says, I've got toys out here you can play with. There's these wonderful carts. If you come out, I'll give you rides on these carts. And I've got four or five, six different ones. Come out and play in the carts. And the kids think, oh, that's neat. And they come out. But when they get out there, the carts aren't there. And the dad says, no, no, I said that because I knew it was the only way to get you out. But what I really have for you is this cart, the one cart, the great cart. And that is the Mahayana teaching. And that's what it was really about. The other teachings lure you out of the building. And once you're out, you're ready for the true big cart. But the big cart was so wonderful, none of them complained because it was so much better than what he promised anyway. And they all get on the cart. And you, you notice the connection between the cart and the vehicle. It, it, it carries you to nirvana. And so that great vehicle is Mahayana. In fact, Mahayana means the great ve vehicle. So this is actually a carving. It's a little bit hard to see because it's got so much going on. But there's all these carts outside, and there's this building that's on fire. This is a, a representation of the, the Lotus Sutra. Here's another one. Uh, so... This is the teaching of the Lotus Sutra. And you can see how this works with this concept of skillful means and, and this concept of many paths up the same mountain. It's okay to give a lesser vehicle at first because there are many paths up the same mountain and because you all don't have to make it to the top in one lifetime. All of that sets up this kind of ecumenical uh, view of, of uh, other traditions and, and other paths and, and imperfect paths that might take you halfway up for now and then maybe you'll get on something else later and this sets up this kind of view of how things work. But skillful means grows from this one idea because again in the sutra it's being said that the skillful means means he's not lying by, by providing these other, other teachings. And the, other te the lesser vehicles the Hinayana, the lesser vehicles versus the Mahayana, the great vehicles. The Hinayana aren't lies, they're just the first step. And that's a skillful means. So skillful means grows from that concept to, to a much larger one. And one that I'm actually, I actually really like and don't like. It's got problems and, and, and yet I really enjoy it. In one sense, skillful means is a, is a much better way of viewing the things we do that are problematic as compared to sin, right? So when, when I viewed uh, my mistakes as sin, it was like the, there was some guy up in, in, in the sky who was uh, getting mad at me because I had broken a rule and he was judging me and that's this concept of sin that made me dirty. And the, and the concept of skillful means 
when it's expanded to view all of the things we do wrong, which it is in the Mahayana tradition, is a much more healthy way of viewing it is that this was not smart. It caused suffering for myself and it caused suffering for someone else and I made a mistake and it was not skillful means. And so skillful means is the right way and unskillful means is the wrong way and it's only wrong because it's not skillful. Right? It's, it's not, it's not the, the, the intelligent or the best solution to this problem. And when we view our mistakes that way, there's a lot less self-loathing in, in things, and, and we just fix it. Right? Oh, look, you notice that this was wrong, you notice this wasn't the best way to do it, and you go about fixing it. I love the concept of skillful means. In the other sense, it's also uh, utilitarian. And I'm a utilitarian, so that kind of jives with me, right? It's right because it's skillful. What's the difference between things that are right and things that are wrong? Well, the difference between a right and a wrong action is whether it leads to suffering or not, for myself and for others. Suffering is what matters, and suffering is what distinguishes skillful from unskillful and right from wrong. It's a very uh, clear sense of morality. The problem is how it is implemented in this text almost implies, almost implies, that it's okay to lie to people if it will have good outcomes. It's like that, you know, um, you, can do, you can do something wrong because the ends justify the means. And frankly, if the ends don't justify the means, what does? But in this sense, I don't think lying is usually something that leads to a good end. Because when people feel lied to, they stop listening, and then, then you're not able to convince them. You know what I mean? And so my, my problem with the skillful means is when it gets used as a way to justify you know, things that are not, not kind of honest from the beginning. In fact, it's probably the justification that was being used internally by the people who were faking these documents and claiming that they originated with the Buddha. Right? No, the Buddha didn't really say this, but this is a skillful means to bring people to this teaching that we know is true. So I'm going to lie about it. And then I'm going to justify myself in the text I'm writing, and you can see other religious teachers like Joseph Smith doing this, right? The Book of Mormon is, is a forgery, it's a fraud. Um, but he's got this section in DNC 19 where he's, he basically says, you know, if, if it brings people to God and, and helps them repent, then it's right, even if it's not exactly honest. It's found in the Doctrine and Covenants section 19. And, there's, and it's supposedly God speaking in that section, but really it's Joseph explaining his own deception. Right. So this is the sort of thing that I have a problem with. So skillful means it can be problematic. It also has a, has, a, has a much better way of viewing mistakes and how to look at the world. So depending on how it's applied, I think this is a really beautiful concept or a potentially dangerous one. So uh, that's skillful means. Compassion. Compassion, again, has always been a part of Buddhism, but what Mahayana Buddhism adds is this idea that compassion is the way in to the path. In other words, in Buddhism, in the earlier form of Buddhism, the way in was represented by the Four Noble Truths. Suffering is bad. Everyone suffers. There's a cause of suffering, therefore there's a way out of suffering, and that way out is the Eightfold Path the Noble Eightfold Path. So the way in was to recognize your own suffering and want to get rid of it. That was the way in. But see, that is self-directed. What the Mahayana did, which was brilliant and effective, was to recognize that for many people, recognizing your own suffering and trying to get rid of it is something that strengthens the concept of self. Right? So one of the ways Buddhism gets rid of suffering is to help us jettison the concept of self. And as we jettison the concept of self, our suffering is reduced. But if we're doing this because we're worried about our suffering, we're already pointing at our own self. And we have a hard time jettisoning the concept of self through that starting point. And so Mahayana Buddhism proposes a slightly different, a slightly different starting point. It's still suffering. And it's even my suffering that I might have compassion on. But it's everybody's suffering, not just mine. It's yours. And I can look at you and I can see you suffer and I can go, I want to help. And every person in the world has had that experience. 
Well, maybe there's one or two people who haven't. Maybe some, some psychotic people just don't have that. But most of us see somebody hurt him and we go, gosh, I want to help. You've experienced that. Because everyone has experienced it, by taking that idea and using it as the starting point for the Buddhist path, they can get more people on the path and it can be more powerful once they're there because they've, it's another way of jettisoning the self. You see, you can jettison it through philosophy. You can meditate and realize it doesn't exist and you can look for it in meditation and you can talk about the philosophical issues with the self and you can do that to tell you're blue in the face or you can forget yourself and serve other people. Right? And so that concept of compassion is, is something that shows up in Christianity, it shows up all over the place. Many religious traditions have used this and this is kind of the, the, the time when Buddhism begins to pick it up and add it as a core concept in how they enter the path of enlightenment. If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. This is the Dalai Lama expressing this Mahayana ideal. So, that of course leads us to the Bodhisattva ideal. What is the Bodhisattva ideal? Well, it's this, I've told, we've already mentioned what a Bodhisattva is, but it's, it's somebody who stays behind, re-enters samsara so that they can save other people. There's a, a bodhisattva vow. It says, I vow to save all sentient beings, right? It's not just myself. I, I vow to bring enlightenment to all sentient beings. I'm seeking Buddhahood not for myself, but for other sentient beings, to bring enlightenment to them. And that's the bodhisattva ideal. And again, it's, it's a different view of how this works. Uh, you can think of it almost like, uh, if, if I were to put this in Christian terms, just so that it, it strikes home as how, how, how different this is, um, someone could say, well, Christ died for me, I'm going to seek salvation. This is almost like saying, no, I'm going to seek to become a Christ who can then go and die for somebody else so they can be saved, and then we can be saved together. You see, um, and it's not the same, that's a horrible analogy, but, but it gives you kind of some of the flavor of how different it was because it was almost antithetical to the Arhant ideal, which was, we don't ever want to go back into samsara, and, and going back is dangerous because you might fall off the wagon and, and get worse and worse instead of going down. But the Bodhisattva ideal was that there's a path, and you progress along the path, and once you get to a point, you're not going to go back. You've achieved enlightenment. You're going to be a Buddha someday. You're just holding off to help other people along the path. You're never going to fall back down. And so again, it's, it's, it's a very different tradition and it created some contention, right? There was arguments about this. Do you want to achieve full enlightenment now or do you want to hold off? Well, if you hold off, uh, you might be born as a god in the next life, but then you might be born as an ant in the next because karma comes and it goes and, and so you don't want to do that. That's the early tradition and then the Mahayana tradition is yes, we do because we love other people. There's another reason they do too. We'll get to it in just a second because all this stuff kind of hangs together when we get to emptiness. So where do these bodhisattvas go? If they're reborn in a much better state, they, they end up in these celestial states and then maybe they come down to this earth once to become a Buddha and teach the teach. This is what, this is what the Buddha did. You see, what they're doing is they take some of these existing stories of the, of the previous lives of the Buddha that already existed in the tradition and they say, look, the Buddha was a bodhisattva and he waited until just the right moment. See, now, bodhisattva doesn't mean you wait to become a Buddha until everyone is enlightened. You wait till the right time when you can do the most good, and then you become a Buddha. And so the Buddha was a bodhisattva for life after life after life, helping people and blessing people and bringing them along the path until he got to a point where achieving perfect enlightenment would allow him to turn the wheel of the Dharma and teach and create this whole tradition of Buddhism that would bless millions of other lives, and that was the moment he chose to step over the edge and become a Buddha. And every Bodhisattva will do that. Well, where do you go between? Well, you go to these celestial heavens. So you get this idea of cosmic heavens, and this is why they introduced this whole cosmology. There's a view of millions upon millions of heavens and millions upon millions of Buddhas and millions upon millions of Bodhisattvas living in each of these heavens, and, and you get worlds upon worlds, and this very, very expansive view of the cosmos. They begin to write about it which again is something the earlier tradition would have said not to think about it. When people ask uh, the Buddha about those things, he would always say, uh, let's not talk about it, let's just worry about how to fix your suffering. 
That stuff doesn't matter, right? And then all this stuff comes in, and now it matters because it's, it's tied into this grand cosmic view of all these compassionate bodhisattvas and Buddhas that you're going to join to help other people achieve enlightenment out of compassion. Uh, so who are some of these people? So the, you not only create these, these grand schemes of heaven, you start to populate it with essentially deities, hundreds and hundreds of named deities. In one sense, they function like the Catholic saints because you can pray to them and they can give you certain blessings and that sort of thing. So in that sense, they're kind of like, they'll be a patron you know, bodhisattva of, patron bodhisattva of. Um, but the people who did this still believed in the Hindu, Indian, Indian gods, the Hindu gods. And so if you ask them, are these, are these saints, are these gods, who are they? And they said, no, they're Buddhas and bodhisattvas. And what does that mean? Well, they are so far beyond the gods that they're not even relevant. I mean, so in terms of how they function, you can think of them as saints and gods, but the practitioners believed in gods and the bodhisattvas, and the bodhisattvas were better than the gods. So these are like super gods. Um, and so one of, let's, I'm, I'm, you know, there are hundreds of these, so if I were to try to do kind of a, a cosmology and a theology and, a, and a, a mythology of all these beings, we would be here all day. I'm gonna give you a couple of the most interesting ones. One is Avalokiteshvara, um, and there is, a, he has a, uh, you know, there's a famous mantra you use when you pray to Avalokiteshvara. It's Om Mani Padme Om. And if you were here live, I was playing uh, a recording of, of a, a, a mantra chant uh, just before we came in. It's Om Mani Padme Om. And this is the, this is the, the, the prayer or the mantra to Avalokiteshvara. And he is the kind of patron bodhisattva of compassion which again is that core concept in uh, Mahayana Buddhism. And in fact, um, and I don't know how you say this, is Chering, Cherenzi uh, is, is, an, is another name for this deity in Tibet. And the, the Dalai Lama is thought to be an incarnation of this deity. So if you want to go meet Avalokiteshvara, you can go hang out and talk to the Dalai Lama. Um, and so he's thought of as this incarnation of Avalokiteshvara. And this is our patron deity of compassion. Uh, he has a wife, or, or I don't know if a wife is the right term, but a, there's a, a female uh, counterpart, a female deity of compassion called Tara, and people will often pray to her. Some of her, um, some of the, the the hymns sort of to her, or or the the, um, the text that praise her, the text of praise to Tara, are fascinating because they often will talk about, you know, blessed is he who you know has sores and pus and and, and suffers horribly because. And all this suffering is worth it because it invokes her compassion. She looks down on the sufferer with compassion and blessed is he who you know, achieves her compassion because they will achieve such a great, uh, great rebirth because her compassion will bless us. This is very similar to the Christian idea of blessed are the poor in heart for they shall inherit the earth. You get the idea, right? Um, and again, you also notice this concept of this wonderful rebirth. Uh, and so the point is to get on the path. The focus has changed from, from achieving uh, enlightenment now to getting on the path to compassion that leads you to the path. And once you get on the path, you achieve through the compassion of someone else. This is a devotional tradition now. This is the introduction of the devotional aspect. It's not through my own works that I'm saved anymore, as it was in the original Buddhist teachings. Now I am saved by and, and enlightened and given better rebirth and brought along the path through the compassion of other beings that I devote myself to in love and worship and praise. And so this is very much, again, like the Christian tradition, that, that we're saved through, through grace, through Christ, and through our devotion to another, another rather than through our own works. Again, there is a, an element of human psychology that each of these religions touch on. They, they touch on them because, and, and we see them showing up again and again, because there is a universal human aspect to this idea. Right? It appeals to people. Just like Christianity appeals to people, this appeals to people for the same reason. It's devotional, 
Buddhism, just like we saw in devotional Hinduism, and just like we saw in Christianity. And it works to remove the concept of self in another way. Because instead of thinking about my own works leading to my enlightenment, you lose yourself in devotion to an idea, a being. Whether the being is real or in your mind, you lose yourself in devotion to this other being, and it creates that mental state of, of the self that, that vanishes. And when the sense of self vanishes, your suffering vanishes. And so this is another one of those things that people do because it works. Uh, so devotional worship. Um, they also have, and there's a god named uh, uh, Matrian, uh, Matreya. Uh, he is the Buddha of the future. So this, the idea of Matreya, he is the, the next one in line to come down. And you know, he's, he's one of, just as the Buddha, was, the, the historical Buddha, was a bodhisattva before he came down and became the Buddha. This person is a bodhisattva up in the, in the heavens and his next rebirth will be to our world to be a Buddha. So he's the next Buddha. He's the Buddha in line. Um, and he'll come and take the place of the historical Buddha. Um, and you can pray to him. In fact, supposedly, unlike the historical Buddha, he's, the historical Buddha is gone, but this person is still there, and he's close to us because he's about to be reborn into our world. And so as someone close to us, he's especially uh, evoc uh, efficacious to pray to him for help if you need it. Uh, he is sometimes visualized this way as the large, fat, jovial Buddha we see in Chinatown. Most people, when they see this statue, this image, think this is the Buddha. Uh, but the, the historical Buddha was uh, a fit prince who then rode out and became an ascetic and almost starved himself to death. And then he's founded a monastic tradition where he would eat two meals or one meal a day. I don't remember which it is. I think one meal a day. And that's it. And just enough to, to subsist on and no more. He was a skinny guy. <laughs> this is not the historical Buddha. This is Maitreya. So whenever you see these kind of big fat Buddhas of the Buddha, Chinatown sort of thing, that, that's not the historical Buddha. It's, it's this Maitreya guy. He's the next Buddha coming. There is a story about him which is fascinating, which uh, reminds one of Santa Claus, literally. He had a bag, and the idea was, at one point, he came down to, to visit the earth or something like that. I don't, I don't know exactly how this worked, but there was a manifestation of him who came to the world and would wander the world, and, and he was a big, fat, jovial guy, monk, who would come around, and he would open his bag, and he would give out gifts to people that would remove their suffering. He knew what they needed, and he would pull out just what they needed and remove their suffering and go to the next person and give a gift, very much like a, a, a Buddhist Santa Claus. And so, again, this is Maitreya. He's a, he's a really fun um, uh, member of, these, of this uh, pantheon of, of deities is really the best way to think about it. Um, uh, Manjushri is the prince of wisdom. I don't think I said that right. And I've, I've heard it said like 20 times in my audio uh, things I've listened to, and I can't, I, it didn't sound right when I just said it. Manjushri, Manjushri. I'm not sure, but he's the prince of wisdom, so I had to show him because uh, this is this is the uh, the the patron bodhisattva of scholars and people who teach comparative religion classes at the Unitarian Church, right? So this is our Manjushriya. He's the prince of wisdom. This is the person you would ask to make sure your class goes well. You can also see uh, Pure Land Buddhism. We have mentioned this before, but this is where it comes from. I mentioned it once before as just a con just to give you a hint of the variety of Buddhism and where Buddhism goes. But Pure Land Buddhism is the worship, worship of a being called Amitabha Buddha. And the idea of Amitabha Buddha was that he, uh, as he became a Buddha, he promised when he was a Bodhisattva, just before he became a Buddha, that when he became a Buddha, he would create a pure land, a heaven, one of the heavens among many in this grand cosmic scheme, where people could be reborn who had prayed with faith and called upon his name in faith. So if you can call upon Amitabha Buddha in faith, really believing that he's going to do this, then when you die, you'll be reborn in the pure land, and there you will, his, his, his grace will shine upon you, literally light from his face will shine upon these lotus blossoms, and the lotus blossom will bud, and you will come out of this lotus blossom and be born 
and not, of a, not, a, not in the messy way we're born here, but out of a lotus blossom in the pure land, and you can live there for some amount of time, and then presumably you would become a bodhisattva. And so this is, again, salvation by faith. And it's worth mentioning, and I did this last time I talked about Pure Land Buddhism, but we're going to do it again. It's worth mentioning if this is even Buddhism anymore. Because Buddhism was about your own efforts and about not relying on the deities anymore, but on using your own efforts to achieve enlightenment so that you would not be reborn. And this is about the opposite, relying on others instead of your own merits so that you can be reborn in a better place. So is this still Buddhism? And yet, I think, it, it, you can see how it grows out of the other traditions, out of the Mahayana tradition, out of the compassion tradition. You notice how it uses this concept of compassion. It's the compassion of Amitabha Buddha that makes him want to create this pure land. And there's still this concept of enlightenment, and there's still this concept of the Buddha, and there's this concept of the Bodhisattva. And you use faith on him to, to become reborn in this place so that you could become a bodhisattva so that someday you can go help. You see, it's, it's all still there. So what I think this really shows us is just how flexible Buddhism is. Buddhism as a core philosophy is capable of operating for atheists. There are atheist Buddhists who do not believe in any of these gods, do not believe in the supernatural at all, but believe that this is a good philosophical way and a good set of meditation techniques to remove their suffering. And there are believers in the historical Buddha who believe in karma and rebirth and believe in the merit he left behind that they might try to access. And there are others who believe in these celestial bodhisattvas and Buddhas that they can pray to who are really there, not just their merit, but they are there and they can answer and give them blessings and save them and bring them to a pure land. All of this is Buddhism, because Buddhism is all of that. Everything from atheism to pure on devotional salvation by faith, all of that is encompassed in this set of philosophy because it's broad enough and flexible enough that it can become whatever it needs to become for the people who encounter it and who are trying to make it their own. So I think that's, that's a very remarkable thing to say about Buddhism. So, the other thing Buddhism uh, Mahayana does is it adds this extra concept of salvation for the lay people. And, and I think as I talked about the other aspects, I've talked about this and how, because it relates to those enough, so we don't have to do it uh, again. But I love this cartoon. Because the path to nirvana it offers is so restrictive and accessible to so few, Theravada is referred to as the small vehicle, of course, by the Mahayana. Vehicle, right? So they have this small bus and this large bus because you see the small bus, only the monks can achieve enlightenment through their own efforts in intense meditation and that's hard. But the large bus, we can all devote ourselves to Amitabha Buddha and we can all find our way onto the Bodhisattva path. Even if we don't make it to the end right now, we can get on that Bodhisattva path right now and we can just get all on board and take off. Which, which, which raises the interesting question to me if the Mahayana is the path that is more accessible to more people, why was that the secret teaching? You'd think the secret teaching would be the hard path that only the, the few could, right? It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but you, you, see, you see how this is, is viewed. So the idea is instead of renunciation, it's open to all. Uh, I want to read this statement by, uh, this is a, um, a teaching, there's a sutra called the Vamalakirti Sutra, which is about the individual Vamalakirti. Vamalakirti is an example of a Bodhi, of a, a, a Mahayana layperson who is on the path, even though they're a layperson. So let me read to you about them. And in the same city, there lived an elder named Vamalakirti who dwelt there as a skillful means for the salvation of other beings. Do you see how the very core concept of the Mahayana was just expressed? For he used his measureless wealth to convert the poor. See, he, he didn't give up his wealth, he's still a rich man. But he uses his wealth to bless the poor instead of giving it up. You see, this is, this is radically different, and it's hard to express how radically different it is 
just by reading it, but think about it. Instead of giving up all his wealth as a renouncer, he stayed wealthy, but he used his wealth to create more wealth that he used to bless the poor, and his own pure virtue to convert those who broke the precepts. He controlled himself with patience to convert the scornful and strove with diligence to convert the lazy. He used his calm meditation to convert the confused and his firm wisdom to convert the ignorant. He wore the white robes of a layman, but he observed the pure conduct of a recluse or of a renouncer. He lived a household life, that's key. He lived a household life, but he wasn't attached to the world. You see it? He's in the world, but he's not attached to it. Um, he had a wife and children, but always practiced the religious life. He kept a household, but always delighted in solitude. He wore jewels and ornaments, but he adorned his body with the signs of greatness. He ate and he drank, but delighted in the taste of meditation. He went to the gambling halls, but he worked for the salvation of men. He went to Vegas, that's great. He took on the ways of the heretics, but he never strayed from the true faith. He knew all the worldly texts, but he always delighted in the teachings of the Buddha. In the world, but not of the world, or, or engaged in the householder life, not a monk, and yet on the path of the bodhisattva to bless other people. If you remember all the way back when we talked about the Bhagavad Gita, do you remember this? The Bhagavad Gita is the essence of bhakti yoga as opposed to, um, you know, janana yoga. And what it said was, do your duty. You don't have to renounce your duty. Go ahead and do your duty, but do it without attachment. And if you do that, and then praise me and devote yourself to me, you can achieve release from samsara without renunciation. That was the essence of bhakti yoga. If you take that essence and apply it back to what we just read from Vimalakirti, you see the resonance. Uh, bhakti yoga and Mahayana Buddhism are reflections of each other. Mahayana Buddhism is a Buddhist version, I believe, of the bhakti yoga path. The last of the concepts of the Mahayana that differs from what we've seen before is this concept of emptiness. Emptiness is an extreme extension of the teaching of no self. No self was always a Buddhist teaching, and the Buddha several times talked about emptiness of self. He says when, you, when something is empty, it's empty of something, right? A bowl is empty, it's, it's not empty, it's empty of something. And so when the Buddha talked about emptiness, he said he meant emptiness of self. But when the Mahayana talk about emptiness, they mean empty. And, and it's an extreme extension of this concept of no self to other things. So let's talk about what we've seen in the philosophy of the self from the various traditions so far. In Hinduism, the self is the Atman, and Brahman is the eternal universe. All, the all. And in Hinduism, the Atman is the Brahman. And the goal of Hindu meditation is to realize that through personal experience. Atman is Brahman. In Buddhism, Atman does not exist. Atmanlessness, or Anatamakara, is the concept. It's this, the, the concept of no self. And the idea is you are like a wave on the ocean. It's not that the wave isn't there, it's that the wave is not separate. It's not really a separate thing from the ocean. You're part of the larger ocean. Uh, you are like a chariot. That should sound familiar, chariots. Uh, but there, there is no chariot as a separate thing. There are axles, right? You are made up of component parts. And that whole is an amalgamation of the parts and the division kind of, of that subset of parts into a single thing is an idea. It's not a reality, it's an idea in your head. And if you realize that, the self melts away. This was the older tradition of Buddhism. And the self melts away. The self is composed of its component parts, called the dharmas. And again, dharma can mean teaching, but in this concept it means 
the individual moments of reality, the, 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 the physical sensations. Again, qualia is a Western philosophical concept that is similar. It's the physical raw sensations. You are a combination of ever-changing, ever-flowing physical sensations. And there is no eternal you because you are not the same from one moment to the next because that combination of sensations is not the same from one moment to the next. Uh, one way to say this is you cannot step into the same river twice. The next time you step in, it's a different river. You yourself are the river. and You can't step in twice. That was the earlier tradition. The new tradition is like this. Anything I say about this will be wrong. If I say it's blank, I've already made it non-blank and it's wrong. But the self is empty. Oh, now, I've, now I've made it non-empty. I've already messed it up. This is the idea that you can't step into the same river once. And it's, uh, it's, it's uniquely Mahayana. It is different than what came before, and it is more extreme than what came before. What they are essentially arguing is that the dharmas don't even exist. Not only are the dharmas empty of a separate self and identity, they, they don't exist. It's not there. There's nothing there. Nothing. And you would think that that would lead to a tradition of inaction. If nothing's there, then nothing matters. Why do we do any of it? Why does compassion matter if nothing is real? including the suffering of others. Why? Well, so, the traditional practice of emptiness is to realize that everything is an illusion, to some extent. Everything, not just um, the, the sense of self, but everything is, is really an illusion. It's not really there. And then to... Uh, to come back to the concept that, and yet, we live in this illusion, and it matters. And to somehow hold those two conflicting concepts in your mind at the same time. Because the practice of emptiness is the practice of holding conflicting concepts in your mind at once. This is why Zen Buddhism practices kohens and all this other stuff, because it's a contradiction, and yet it is true. So, for example, the tea ceremony will begin where the tea is just the tea. And then the tea is not just the tea. It doesn't even exist. And then it ends with the tea is just the tea again. And so the concept and the ritual is to drag you start you in a concept of, remember when I talked about the two truths? In Buddhism, there are two truths, conventional truth and ultimate truth. Well, in this case, ultimate truth is an extreme version of nothing is real. And what you do is you start in conventional truth, you bring the mind into ultimate truth, and then you come back to conventional truth, and you try to hold a piece of that ultimate truth there with you as you come back. So a poem might help. Old Pond. Frog jumps in. The sound of water. This is a, this is a very traditional Japanese poem. You can see it's very Spartan, right? But but what is that all about? The pond is ultimate truth. It's there, and it and it's it's this everything, right? The pond is there. The frog is an individual. It's a it's a, it's a it's a separate individual, and separate individuals don't exist in ultimate reality. But that's conventional reality. And the frog jumps in. That's an action of an individual, right? And, and then. And then what happens when, when, when an individual thing makes contact with some other individual thing? There's a sound. But the sound is just perception. And that perception lives in the middle of ultimate and conventional reality. And this is all very abstract and it's all very complex. But the basic idea is just that compassion is how we start along the path. And it leads us to the conclusion that the people I had compassion for don't exist. And I don't exist. And therefore, I should have compassion on me and these other people that don't exist because, and you try to hold those concepts in your mind at the same time. And it's very hard and it's very uh, challenging and it's very deep and it's very philosophical. And, and, uh, and 
it's half of the fun, is to try to do this with your head. Try to wrap your head around this if you want. Whether you believe it or not is not important. Try to wrap your head around it. Because there's certainly some truth to this idea that all we are is atoms moving in a, in a large sea. And yet, I love people. People love me, and I don't want to see other people hurt. And yet, we're all atoms moving in this large sea. And all of that's true at the same time. And you know what? Your suffering isn't quite as bad after you've gone through that, that path. If you can pull some of that ultimate reality back into your conventional reality and still act with compassion in your conventional reality, some of the suffering goes away because you hold it less tightly. You hold your, your thoughts, your ideas, your desires a little less tightly, but they're still there and they still matter and you still act with compassion and love. And this is the heart of the Mahayana tradition. It's this idea of compassion, love, and emptiness, interplaying and working together. It's also tied with this concept of, no, of dualism, right? All, the, all, all elements of dualism are illusions. Where dualism is me and you, there is no me and you, there is just reality. And so anytime you have a dualism, it's not real. That presents all sorts of challenges because it means that samsara and nirvana are the same thing. And suddenly you realize a second reason why bodhisattvas come back. Because there's no difference. There is no difference between samsara and nirvana. It's all the same thing. And they come back to help other people realize it's all the same thing. And this creates a very different method of enlightenment. Because for traditional Buddhist teachings, samsara and nirvana are very different. You start in samsara, you recognize that you're suffering, and you work to achieve nirvana so that your suffering ends. And you haven't achieved it until your suffering ends. But that creates something to strive for, and that very striving can be rec has been recognized as a challenge to achieving the goal. Because as long as you desire something to be other than it is, well, that's the cause of suffering, right? The recognition that it's already there is a powerful way out for many people. Some people find this more attractive and a more attractive way of working their way out of their suffering is to realize that to achieve some nirvana, I don't have to change anything. I don't have to change me. I don't have to change my mind. I don't have to achieve something in deep meditation. I just have to accept and see what is already here with new eyes. And, and that works for a lot of people in a much better way. So again, uh, I, I really like um, what, what um, Joseph Goldstein says in One Dharma. He says, each of these are different ways of thinking about it and pick the one that works for you instead of arguing about which one is true. In other words, think of them as skillful means. A very Mahayana sort of thing to say. Think of them as skillful means and find the one that works for you and find your way out of your own suffering. Now, what the Mahayana did in moving from, uh, from bhakti yoga, or sorry, from moving from, in, in moving from uh, intellectual Buddhism kind of to, and, and, and monastic Buddhism to this devotional Buddhism is it created a window for Buddhism to move into China, or a door, it created a door for Buddhism to move into China because China has, had traditionally been opposed to, uh, to monasticism, or at least suspicious of monasticism. Uh, at least, at least the, the Confucian elements of China had been deeply opposed to that idea or suspicious of the idea of monasticism. And so Buddhism would have had a hard time in China before the Mahayana reform. But the Mahayana reform made it possible for Buddhism to move east. And when it moved east, it encountered Confucianism, and it encountered uh, Taoism, and it incorporated elements of both. And those elements became part of the Mahayana tradition, 
as it moved into China and as it was, influ it was it, as it interacted in China, and then as it went further into Japan, it interacted with the Shinto traditions. So uh, there is one other Buddhist tradition we can talk about, and that is the Vajrayana. So we have a list of things now to discuss. Vajrayana and Buddhism as it moves into China and Buddhism as it moves into Japan and we get Zen Buddhism. And we have this Vajrayana thing to talk about. And we also have a problem. And that's Confucianism, Taoism, and Shintoism, which we have not talked about, but which impact how this next event on our story happens. So I could tell this next event and just tell you how Confucianism impacted it, but that wouldn't be very helpful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop Buddhism for a while. We're going to go do uh, Confucianism. We're going to talk about Confucianism. We're going to talk about uh, Taoism. And we're going to talk about uh, Shinto. And then we'll come back to Buddhism. And then we'll talk about how Buddhism entered China through the Mahayana and then how it entered Japan. And before we do that, we may or we may not want to talk about Vajrayana. I need to decide what I'm going to do here. Let me tell you what Vajrayana Buddhism is. Vajrayana Buddhism is Mahayana Buddhism with an overlay of... Um, uh, I have I having brain cramps. Um, uh, we did this in Hinduism, and I've lost the term. Uh, um, what is the name for... Uh, anyway, this is, this is the, the mystical tradition we did in Hinduism, remember, that, that was about power, and, and the name has to do with the warp and the woof of the, of the fabric of reality. Um, Tantra. Dang it. That's not hard. I don't know why sometimes brains shut down. Tantra. So what Vajrayana Buddhism is just, it's Mahayana Buddhism with an overlay of tantric practice. And the Tantra of Buddhism is very similar to the Tantra of Hinduism. And we've already discussed that. So, you know... All we have to do is take that and kind of overlay it on top of Buddhism and see how Buddhism reacts to it. And we have Vajrayana Buddhism. And that's what we have in Tibet and the Dalai Lama. And we've discussed the Dalai Lama as if he was a, Mah a member of the Mahayana. But again, Vajrayana is Mahayana with a tantric overlay. And so we need to figure out, I need to figure out what we're going to do for next month. But we either need to talk about Vajrayana and then take a break from Buddhism, or we need to... Um, back up and do Confucianism and, and, uh, and Taoism and Shintoism. So uh, that's kind of where we're headed next. I'm so glad you came. Thank you for coming. I hope that what we said helped you on your path and, and your search for truth and meaning. And I hope to see you next time. Thank you. Any burning questions? Nick, check. It's, uh, so he, the question was, what was the, what was the representation of the, of the cart? Yeah, um, sometimes there's be two, two oxen pulling. Oh, so I, I don't think that that's uh, something that they specify, like the number of oxen. I don't think there's some symbolism there that I know of. Uh, the idea of the cart is the Buddha taught very explicitly that uh, the, the teaching is not the goal. The teaching is the path that gets you to the goal. And thus the image of a cart or a raft or a finger that points at the moon are all good analogies for the teaching, for the, the, the teaching that is the vehicle or the path that brings you somewhere and where it's bringing you is to enlightenment, uh, bodhisattva. Uh, the wheel of the Dharma, I, uh, I think that has more to do with like the wheel of, of samsara um, and it turns with birth and rebirth. But in this case, what we're doing is we're turning the wheel of the Dharma, meaning we're, we're presenting a, a set of teachings and it comes around and we present another set of teachings uh, and, 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 and the, the teachings come and they go in a kind of cyclical manner. I think that's the concept of the turning of the wheel uh, and why they use that terminology. But in, in, both, in that case, they're describing the, um, the different sets of, of Buddhist literature because there's a whole set of Buddhist literature that comes out once 
and then there's a set of Buddhist literature that comes out again, and it, there's a recognition that this is a different set of teachings, and uh, and they had to explain well where did this new set of teachings come from, and uh, the, the 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 idea is well these were secret teachings of the Buddha that were hidden, and now they're coming forth at a later date in the second turning of the wheel. In other words, a reintroduction of, the, of new Buddhist teachings to the world. We've got these Buddhist teachings, they've been secret, now we're going to give them to the world, and that's the second turning. And it's really the production of the second set of, of scriptures that were these things claimed to have been taught by the Buddha. Yeah? What is that place in the northwest corner? I'm not sure. Yeah, we looked this up at one point. What is it called? Call my Kaya. Call my Kaya. Somebody at one point, I remember we had that question, and somebody uh, did a, a Google search, and there was a, a, a whole history behind it. A group of Buddhists that moved there, and, and they met with some other people, and it mixed with about three other traditions. And it was a whole very fascinating story behind why there's a Buddhist enclave all the way out to the west. And I don't remember any of it. Only place in, in what you see, Europe, in Europe. That where yeah. Buddhists uh, represent a majority of the it's population. The most and there's a story behind why that is, and I don't know what it was, though. I can't remember. Any other burning questions? All right, I'll see you next month. Thank you for coming. <laughs>